Hello, and welcome to our podcast, Where the Dark Corners Are. Travels hostess tonight. The gang's all here, including Slashes with Samantha and the Panda. But more importantly, so is the. In 1995, in 1995, a team of paranormal travel podcasters found an abandoned cub in the haunted Arctic. After some kick-ass paranormal training and his first alien kill. <laughs> Was ready. He was ready. ready. So, if ghosts, serial killers, or monsters in the dark got you scared, don't hesitate to call the Polar Bear. The Polar Bear. And we have the. Road yes. trip with the panda. <laughs> mess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so as you heard, we the gang's all here, and it just occurred to me that I do have our gang's all here theme song for everyone to hear. Uh oh, for the first time. Uh, except we today we moved to a different location, and I left my computer at uh, the other location. So not today. <sighs> Is it on your phone? Sort of. Sort of. You can't say that. Yeah, well, I don't know why, why you it. Why, that, why yeah. are we doing this? All right. Either way, I did actually want to take a quick second and apologize for the audio. It was not as clear as they our episodes tend to be. Last episode, as our, our the cast here know, I've been dealing with pneumonia for the last two weeks, and Sierra... I had opted to do a call in instead of being with me in the studio, which is perfectly fine because I don't want to give anybody pneumonia except for these guys. And so that's how come the audio was not as as good as it typically tends to be. So just a quick apology for that. Yeah. All right. So tonight we are actually all here and we're actually here with a pretty serious and an exceptionally dark corner topic. This was a polar bear topic. You know, I know we many times when we refer to dark corners in our podcasts, we usually talk about places, locations, haunted destinations. But today we're going to talk about dark corners that dwell in your mind. Our primary subject today is the lead singer of my person, one of my favorite bands, Linkin Park, Chance Chester Bennington. He was born March 20th, 1976, and ended his own life on July 20th, 2017. Today we're going to dive down and talk about what made a ma- major rock star with plenty of wealth, fame, and loving family and his own life. Sam? Yes, I do want to stress the importance of how important this topic is and that we did get our silliness out at the beginning because there's really not much to find humor in. I think a lot of us have been affected with situations like this and we want to say that A, we're going to talk about some really deep topics, so spoiler or not content warning that we're going to be talking about sexual abuse, substance abuse, and then suicide. So just put that out there first. And like I said, we I'm sure a lot of us have been affected by that. And I think it's important for us to echo to our audience that we do understand the gravity of this because it is a difficult conversation. So, And it affects a lot of people. But as Polar Bear said, Chester was born on March 20th, so he would have just turned 47 years old today if he would have been alive. When he was around 7 years old, Chester experienced sexual abuse. So with my notes, I chose to focus primarily on quotes that he had said to other people because he was very open about talking with these struggles. And I think it's important instead of hearing my voice or my version of the story that we hear 
his exact words. So in a 2008 interview with Tom Bryant, he stated, I started getting molested when I was seven or eight. I w- it was by a friend who was a few years older than me. It escalated from a touchy, curious, what does this thing do, into a full-on crazy violation. I was getting beaten up and being forced to do things I didn't want to do. It destroyed my self-confidence. He was also quoted by Metal Hammer as saying, like most people, I was too afraid to say anything. I didn't want people to think I was gay or that I was lying. It was a horrible experience. This abuse that he experienced didn't end until he was 13 years old. So he, his father was a police detective and his mother was a nurse, and they separated and got divorced when he was 11 years old. When they separated, he moved in with his father, and he had three siblings, but he was largely left to his own devices. Grunge.com quotes him as saying, It was an awful time. I hated everybody in my life. I felt abandoned by my mom. My dad was not very emotionally stable then, and there was no one I could turn to. At least that's how my young mind felt. The only thing I wanted to do was kill everybody and run away. In an attempt to numb his pain and loneliness, he took drugs and started abusing marijuana, alcohol, opium, cocaine, methamphetamine, and LSD. In an interview with Louder in 2016, Chester stated, I was on 11 hits of acid a day. I dropped so much acid that I'm surprised I can still speak. I'd smoke a bunch of crack, do a little bit of meth, and just sit there and freak out. Then I'd smoke opium to come down. I weighed 110 pounds. When he turned 17, he started living with his mother, and it was during this time that his mother caught him abusing drugs and forbade him to leave the house. She, in essence, put him on house arrest. Due to his severe meth and cocaine addictions, Chester recalled in an interview with Metal Hammer, my mom said I looked like I stepped out of Auschwitz. I was, so I used pot to get off drugs. Every time I'd get a craving, I'd smoke my pot. According to thegrunge.com, his early substance abuse also resulted in an, at least one truly frightening encounter with shady elements when a criminal gang came to the house he was hanging out in and violently robbed the place. This inspired Chester to quit drugs for the most part with the help of his mother's forced house arrest. But he continued to use pot and alcohol, alcohol that would be a lifelong demon for him, although he did go through periods of being sober and alcohol would be present in his system at the time of his death in 2017. He also started working at Burger King and other odd jobs to earn money. And he had always wanted to be a rock star and he ended up joining a band called Grey Days as their lead singer in 1993, although they had amassed a following, a pretty good one, Chester eventually left the band in the late 90s due to creative differences. Nice. I mean, I'd, li- I'd like to pause the notes and stuff and just talk about what, how much you read and what you read, but just being able to, or even trying to imagine, he had a pretty fucked up childhood since he was nine. And, I mean, that's that's... That's crazy. Like your your mind's like barely developing into trying to perceive the world, and it's already a negative outlook on everything. That that power of being yourself is being taken away from him by uh, by someone else. And then from what I from what I read, it was his first encounter with drugs. He was struggling through that emotional damage of uh, being sexually abused, and the drug you know the guy who was selling him drugs was like, you know, I know you're going through a lot. I can make it go away, you know, you just take this. And so the thought of that kind of made him like, oh, you know, I can feel better if I just take this pill or if I smoke the cigarette or so on and so forth. Well, that's kind of one of the things about narcotics and alcohol. A lot of people lean on them to hide the pain, hide the hurt, to hide behind and, and to cope. And we also see this sometimes with people with mental health issues as well. Mm-hmm. On top of all the other issues that people, you know, are felt or are, are facing and dealing with or not. Basically not. And so they turn to a coping mechanism such as alcohol, such as drugs, such as, I mean, other nefarious things. Cutting. Yeah, anything you know. to release that pain. Right. And it's it, it's a pattern that we see and are aware of. And it always kind of baffles me a little bit. And, you know, we fall down and we hurt our arm. We see this is where it hurts. Mm-hmm. 
make a point to it and say, right. this is where it hurts. But if somebody hurts us in a way, in that fashion, instead of going to somebody and saying, this is what hurts, mm-hmm. we choose other coping mechanisms. Right. That unfortunately lead us to darker paths, mm-hmm. to real world dark paths. Yeah. Well, and it's indicative of the time. So 47 years old today, if he would be alive, back then being gay was a horrible thing to, for people to think yeah. that you are. People weren't as open as they are now about their and trauma, absolutely. emotions, I, you even know, their uh, sexual orientation. Well, when when I was, this. you're a child of the 80s, I'm a child of the 80s, to be a tomboy was like, whoa, whoa. Had to play softball, be butch. And... I mean, even back then, where I would argue our society was a lot more accepting to a lot of things, but definitely not homosexuality. I mean, again, dressing up as a boy was an issue, yeah. Correct. Well, even mental illness. Like, I have extreme social anxiety. I have extreme just anxiety in general, and that was not something that was acceptable. It wasn't something that you talked about. My best friend took his life in when I was a senior junior in high school and my mom I just remember my mom asking me are you okay do you need to talk to someone I was like no I'm not crazy I don't need to talk to someone but I did I was 16 17 years old I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that this person was gone that was one of the biggest loss that I had experienced to that date and I wasn't willing to talk to anybody a lot of people aren't willing to talk because they're like that's a weakness or people are going to think I'm crazy or if I go talk to a shrink and someone sees me walk in and out of that office what are they going to think about me or that's a hurt I don't want to, to deal uh, with. To right. deal with. To pull out. 100%. But I do think, to a large extent, it does not necessarily have to be as extreme as this for people to look at their lives and think suicide is a viable option. Sometimes we just have a really rough patch, and people think that suicide is the better option. Well, that is just unbearable. The pain is just too much. How right. can I deal with this? And when you perpetuate that with drugs and alcohol, that well just gets deeper. You yeah. get further and further in that hole to where you can't pull yourself out. And that was my friend. He was so drunk that I don't think he was in his right mind. If he could go back and think about that choice that he made, would he do it again? I don't know. I mean, we've lost teenagers in our tiny town where it was heartbreaking and the whole town was out there. I mean, you guys, I'm sure, know exactly which one I'm talking about. And we were, it was, I mean, it was horrible. Like... Could, would they make these decisions again? Like, if they could see that there's another side and there's a way out, would you make that same decision? And Yeah, I can't really stress enough that, like, the age that, I mean, in this particular case happened to him. And, I mean, in, even in your friend's case, 15, 16 years old, I mean, you feel like you have life figured out because you're, you're almost as tall as everybody else. You You know, you have a thought process. You're realizing mom and dad don't really know everything. You have your own opinions, but... On the other hand, you have no life experience or really no knowledge on where to go, what to do. You have all these feelings, emotions built up in you, and which was what brought me back to, to why I chose this topic is I was standing there doing dishes in my kitchen, and I was l- listening to music, and the song came on. They just, Linkin Park re-released their songs from back in the day, um, um, Meteora, yeah, Mete- Me- Meteora album, which came out in like 2006, I think, and it was a song that never made it onto their album. And just hearing Chester's voice was like, "That's my childhood," you know. That's what I was listening to because he was angry. I mean, he was angry with his life. It was, he was. They, they were basically putting all their emotions on their sleeve into their songs. And then when you're 15, 16, uh, whatever, 13, you know, you have all these emotions built up in you and that was just, I don't know, that's what you listen to, the angry music. We were all those angry teen- teenagers for well, a while, right. you know. Well, after, you know, he commi- he did what he did, you know, if you go back and listen to the lyrics, you know, we were all singing it from the heart just because whatever, because it sounds, you know, it sounds great. His voice was one of the best voices, you know, everywhere. I was very fortunate one time to go see them live, and he he's amazing. And But the point I was trying to make was that all the vocals in all their songs, they all say basically the same thing, like, you know, I, I got nowhere to go. I'm just going to keep going or, you know, keep struggling. All their songs about struggle is something else. Mm-hmm. Like, no, I don't think anyone really stopped to look at the lyrics. Literally, is a song called Nobody's Listening. <laughs> so, I mean. Yeah. 
I think that what you guys are saying is correct. There is a certain level of the fact that when you're a teenager, especially when we were listening to these guys, I mean, I was listening to them in middle school, high school when they were coming out. It was almost like I was listening to the lyrics and I felt seen for the first time. Like everything else was poppy and fun and upbeat and these were dark. It was like really like, oh my gosh, someone else feels the same way too. Someone else, like I'm going to listen to this and it's going to be therapeutic and it's going to make me feel connected to someone in these really hard, deep feelings. And I think a lot of people go gravitate towards music to fill that connection to someone else, to feel that their feelings are kind of normal. Well, believe it or not, you know, at this moment, we're talking uh, two basic generations listening to the same music for the same understanding. Yeah. Right. I, I remember when we... You had your Hybrid Theory album. Correct. Which was, I think, their first... Big one, if not yeah, the first so, one anyways. Yeah, that's what put them on the map. I mean, right. if we can take a pause, I can rattle off some. Uh, right, well, I got you. Some of their things. So hybrid, hybrid Theory, theory yeah. and then Meteora yeah. came out next. Hybrid Theory came out in 2000 and was certified Diamond by R R I A A. So it was, it was their first album, and it was it was like one of the most selling albums ever for alternative rock. So that really just kind of put him over the top. Well, and that's when he went on tour with Chris Cornell and Soundgarden at the time. And you know, right. Soundgarden, Soundgarden was already their thing, but that's where him and Chris Cornell become friends. Yeah, so when he was growing up, he really, he admired Chris Cornell because he loved Soundgarden and stuff. Chris Cornell's, uh, there's there's a bit of a age, like 10, 10, 15 years yeah, older. Yeah, he was so. he was definitely older, but you know, Soundgarden had just made, started making their own name for themselves at least 10 years in the making of everything. And then, then they went on tour together actually when hybrid theory came out. So, but which I mean, which also contributed to, to I think Chester's mental state anyways, but that same year that Chester committed suicide was the same year. Chris Cornell was found in his hotel room on a tour, literally a day of a show two months before Chester's death hanging. So, and you know, Chris Cornell himself was dealing not necessarily the same issues as, Chester, you know, I, I I couldn't find anything like molestation or anything like that, but because he was he was born to a you know, at first a stable family, they went to church and everything else, and then he kind of just sprung off his own wheels, without really any explanation. He just kind of, just the way he felt and the way he was feeling towards things, and he started going down this, quote unquote, darker path on the music path. You know, at age twelve, he's already doing drugs and experiencing alcoholism and he's I mean he's trying these different things out and like you said 15 year olds you know like you said they're free mind and do what they want especially around the 80s and everything else you're experiencing it's a, that's a whole new world right there that's a big turnaround in our timeline around our history so he's experiencing himself and he's experimenting everything else around him and he he's had and he kind of fluctuates he develops anxiety over the years but you know if you watch his performances and stuff he's also got a beautiful voice I mean, I couldn't name a bunch of songs by him. He, I mean, he goes on to win Grammys. He's he's nominated for Golden Globes for his music. I mean, everything. I mean, this guy's basically helped make grunge. Right, and I mean that was that was part of the reason Chester admired him. He was he was the idol, and he and then Chester lived up to that uh, point where he was able to meet his hero type thing. Yeah, and, and they th ended up being. Like best of friends. Best of friends. And, and I their think chemistry was great. Yeah. I think it's because they both kind of went through a struggle of, you know, whether drugs and alcohol or whatever. Exactly. They both, like you said, you know, you reconciled to the music of Linkin Park without even knowing you did. You know, it spoke to everything that you were thinking without even trying. It just hit that point and it didn't have to say anything. You just knew. And so when they toured together, they even were trying new things together and it just came, the chemistry was so there that they became friends for. Since that point, and they even, Chris Cornell's son, or one of their sons, the other one became the godfather mm -hmm. of their son. Yeah, Chris Cornell. I think Chris Cornell's godfather son was, somebody. godfather was Chester. I think it's the other way around. But maybe you're right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Either way, I mean, they, were, they were that tight. Yeah. And so. Both of their families, the um, uh, Chester's most recent wife and uh, Chris Cornell's wife, they were getting along and they were, they were just... It's just, just those two families, friends. Yeah, yeah. Just two friends, families family. hanging out, especially in the same industry, the same, it was similar music of, you know, grunge or, you know, a bit darker, heavier 
you know, that kind of thing. And it's such, it's a, such a great thing to have, but even the strength of their friendship and family ship they have just wasn't enough. And, you know, Chris Grinnell even quoted that no matter how happy you are, you can wake up one day without any specific thing occurring to you, occurring to bring you down to, into a darker place. And, and that was why it was such an eventful year, too, because Chris Cornell committed suicide. I mean, we can get down that rabbit hole, too. Supposedly, it might not have been suicide, but until that's proven otherwise, he was good. He was, all, his, all the interviews they did with people, they said he was doing better. He was great. He, was, he wasn't down a dark path or anything, but like that quote, you know, and any day it just could be, just, it ain't worth it, you know. Well, that's what they think. I don't know. But then two months later. Yeah. So how did, how did Chris... Uh he also hung himself. He hung himself. Yeah, in his hotel room after, like after a show. After the show, his bodyguard at the time they gave him anti-anxiety mes- medicine. So he, he just got back onto it, and he left. I mean, he made sure he was good, and then he went back. The bodyguard went back to his hotel, and then supposedly the wife was stating that she got a weird call from Chris, and she was like, "That's not. That's kind of weird." So she had to, she had him check Chris checked on, but by then it was too late. So, you know, that's one of the unfortunate things is sometimes the medication that we're given for antidepressants is a factor in, in suicide. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, the, the well problem that's the side of some of the side effects of the antidepressants is correct. Suicide. <laughs> suicide and deeper depression. And the medicine itself was newer to to him. But I mean, it wasn't like I think he's taken it before I was reading. It's like it wasn't the first time for him. But I mean. Maybe he didn't take it. Maybe he cheeked it. I don't know. Sometimes, you, sometimes that's what happens. You, you, they get down in this rut or whatever they got going on. They put on this face to appease the others, or they hide things from them. So if they're taking medicine, they say, "Oh yeah, I'm taking my medicine. I'm doing whatever. I'm doing well." Just to make things fly by, you make it easier to to ease into the to this to whatever they're about to do. Yeah. Well, that and then you can't mix them. <laughs> you can't mix them with other shit, mm-hmm. well, alcohol or drugs or any other prescribed medication. The side effects can be. Whatever. Right. I mean, it just takes one bad pill. But, I mean, if you're already taking that, I mean, you're already kind of struggling. So, Right. And, I mean, Chris Cornell's death really hit Chester hard. After the death, Bankton had commented on Cornell's death on Instagram, stating that he could not imagine a world without Cornell. Mike Shinoda, who was a co-singer of Chester in Lincoln Park, noted that Bankton was very emotional when the band performed One More Light in Cornell's honor on Jimmy Kimmel's show, or live. It was like two days after his death or something, right? Mm. It was like super, yeah. super like close to after his death. Mm-hmm. And Bennington could not finish singing the song during the rehearsal because he started getting choked up. The band was due to recover a live performance of their single Heavy on the show, but Bennington decided instead to play One More Light after hearing the news about Cornell's death. The, since the song is about a loss of a friend. On May 16, 2017, a week after Kimmel performance, Bangton sang Leonardo Cohen's song Hallelujah at Cornell's funeral in Los Angeles. And so, mixture of that, and then from what I watched and found, he was also under a lot of stress because of their album. They, they put out a new album, and even though, it, I mean, it was a good album, and they said that Chester poured, like, everything into it. Do you do you remember the name of the album? What oh, is it? I remember, you know, it was Sucks Tunes, and it first came out, I didn't I didn't like it. And it's very unfortunate, because you're right, he did, if you listen to it, it's straight up a note being <laughs> left behind. A suicide note? Yeah. That, that's what Sam did said. Did I not yeah. say this yeah. weeks ago? Yeah. I'm like, it. I mean, he, everything is just a successive track where it gets worse and worse and worse, where it's just, you can see and hear the lack of hope that he has. Mm-hmm. And I I think that he left that behind for his loved ones to make peace, to understand what his state of mind was. Mm-hmm. And what, so what they said is, he, he, you know, he poured so much of himself into that album, and it wasn't received well. It It, it did good on sales, and it did good on, like, reviews it wasn't received well by the fan base yeah because it was it was softer and i mean lincoln park did that like i mean i have a confession to made make i i love their first two albums and the, you know but what you know once they started progressing their sound changed a little bit and you know i kind of fell off the wagon of listening to them 
and then I'd come back and then so on and so forth. And But their fan base felt like they'd just gone soft. They were selling out to be... Right, when they were doing all the Other Transformers bands. movies. Right. Like every Transformers you get a Linkin Park song. Right. Transformers. So it's kind of weird. Did they do Twilight too? I think they did a Twilight song. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's it's weird to think that Linkin Park was doing motion picture soundtrack songs. I mean, I guess it's not that weird because like in the 80s stuff, they would do that and that's how they get their music across in the first place. Mm-hmm. And I mean, now you go back, and especially now that we're not, you know, we'll probably will never get another new content release of Link of Park, you know, we really appreciate the songs that we got from, you know, even if it is Transformers or whatever else. Yeah. And then the, this new re- re-release was great because, I mean, it's more, they're unfinished songs, and I air quote unfinished because when they play them, they sound finished to us, but I guess not to, to, uh, them. to yeah. them. It's wrong. Well, it's like Juice World too. I mean, he was working on a lot of oh. tracks prior to his death as well. Mm-hmm. And so... They've started to re or to release all of those after the fact, mm-hmm. which is kind of weird and interesting because you're like, well, I know he isn't making it right now. We right. made it before, but I mean, I think we see a lot of um, creative people in this type of situation. So we had Kurt Cobain that was just oh. struggling, right. and then we have Chester. We have. Soundgarden, we have what I just said. Juice World. Right. And so, I mean, we just, we see these guys just really, really struggling with the pressure. I think pressures of fame because we're holding them up. Like, even Macklemore releases some songs. And I mean, mind you, he's alive, so he's not in this realm, per s- so to speak. Mm-hmm. But he talks about relapsing. He talks about his struggle with addiction. And then he talks about how when he relapses, he doesn't even feel like he can get himself where he needs to be because everyone's just like, you're an inspiration. And he's like, I'm not an inspiration. I just relapsed, but I can't even tell you that. Right. And we can't, you can't tell them how they feel. Right. I can't tell you how you feel right now. I mean, that's just, I mean, I could try. I could say <laughs> you, you don't feel that way. You're like, yeah, okay, sure. I guess so. <laughs> well, and we love listening to them because we're relating to them and we're missing the fact that art imitates life. And these creative tortured souls are putting everything that they have into these things and we're just listening to it on face value and being like, oh, this hits with me. But what's the story behind that? How do you create dark music like that or music that's so deep and so emotional if there isn't deepness and emotion behind it? And it's just then something like this happens mm-hmm. and we're like, oh, holy hell, I didn't <laughs> oh, realize no. he was depressed. And it's like, did you hear the last album? He pretty much said goodbye. Like, how did no one hear this? Well, and it sucks because if you do re- hear release songs or something that was made by them after they've passed, that means they weren't planning on doing what they did. They literally are, were thinking about future, the future of making more projects and doing other things, making these plans until something stood in their way in their mind and then said, no, you're, that's it. So Well, I think he really puts a explanation point on that point because in heavy, he says, I don't want my mind to get this heavy, but... What oh am yeah. I supposed to do? How do I get out of this? Well, I mean, yeah, the music, the music was, you know, the work. In, in one of the interviews, he said uh, he was talking to, and he's all, he pointed at his head, and he said, "This, this p- is not the place I want to be alone, left alone. This is not the place that I want to be at." So, you know, he focuses on family, he focuses on music, and that happens to a lot of re- recovering addicts, oh. to where they need something to keep them busy. Like, they have way more motivation than I would on a regular day because they're trying to keep their mind off the drugs. So walk us through the last part of his life. So, yeah, that was, you know, that was it. He was he was actually doing well rehabilitating from all the drugs and everything. He actually ended up turning to alcohol, and then he even stopped drinking. And, and it was a continuous thing. You know, he'd relapse and so, so on and so forth, and he'd stop again. In the days before he died, Chester Bington had seemed happy and well, as his wife, uh, Talinda Bington, recalled. A couple days before he took his own life, the family were, were on a vacation at the beach. And I've even seen the video where he's just hanging out with his kids and the family, and the, they're all eating the j- jelly jelly beans and shit. Yeah, they're just, it's literally, they're on the balcony at the beach. Just oh, eating. oh yeah, I've seen the picture, and yeah. then there was a video. Well, the video, of yeah. Yeah, they're, they're eating jelly beans and having a blast, and he's laughing. And so his wife, Delinda, she went on the news and she said he didn't. There was no clue. Yeah, she had no idea. And she even knew what to look for because uh, he, he's attempted suicide before. 
and you know she knew what to look out for he, she said everything was fine he was happy and that brings me to another little topic that we can talk about is people who do who are ready to commit suicide when they have their plan figured out in their head all those worries everything you know all, all the stress it goes away because all of a sudden there's a way out of the darkness they ha- they have a plan there's like, an ending. everything's gonna end yeah well look at twitch too i mean we just lost him and his wife was kind of shocked uh, his friends were family um oh he ended his life oh yeah like a i thought he just months ago. i thought he just About a month ago i yes. remember okay yeah on he the went to like a show? motel yeah he i didn't know he killed family. himself oh yeah left his family home and didn't show up and his wife like sent them out and they found him i thought he died in his sleep or something i didn't know he killed himself <laughs> that's terrible well you know one of the things that Michael and I had recently gone was the suicide forest mm-hmm. in Japan. And I mean, in my whole life, never did I think I would say, you know, I've A, been to Japan and B, walked through the suicide forest. <laughs> but and we and I had mentioned this before you even enter the forest. And now this sign is in J- Japanese. It says, you know, think of your mother, think of your father, think of your family. Think of those who you could potentially be leaving behind. And it's just the concept of suicide is prevalent everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's not an American thing. It's not a Japanese thing. It's a human thing. Right. I think to some degree, everybody at least once in their life has thought about it, has considered that as an option and one of the things that really struck struck me is i actually recently watched an interview with keanu reeves it was just kind of one of those random questions what do you think happens when you die and keanu said the most brilliant thing he said i don't something to the effect of i don't really know but i do know that those who loved us will miss us. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what he said. That that's one. literally what he said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You got it. And I just think that that resonated with me simply because we could be sad and not realize how much we affect others. Right. You know, they, the people who do end up making the plan to commit suicide, they think it's better for them to leave them thinking it's going to better them. But, you know, you see all the the videos of people who, the worst videos are when people get a chance to say the things they, because they will they'll put them in a chair and they'll put someone else in another chair and they darken the room and you can't see their face. So you don't know what it is, but they tell them, you know, you, you, you had a friend who commits suicide, you had someone who commits suicide in your life. You know, what was the thing you would tell them if they were sitting right across from you right now? So they put someone in the chair and they talk to them and they tell them, you know, what, you know, what they, how they feel like, and they, you know, most of them are angry, most of them are sad, and, you know, they always say, like, why would you leave, you know, you made it worse leaving, you made it worse doing the thing you did, you hurt us more by doing what you did, because you thought we weren't worth it, and that's how the people who are left behind feel, so, yeah. people who do and make that call, they feel like it's the better call, but, and ends up hurting them more. Yeah, in reality. It's because those people wish that they did have you. Like, some days, all we can do as parents is get out of bed to just be there for our kids because they need us. Some days, it's just to get out of bed for our family. Some days, it's friends. But we keep driving forward because of that, you know, relationship and that stuff. But to do this is actually, like, it takes a whole level of strength that lots of us don't have. And it's just unfortunate that we can't have them be strong in a different way strong to overcome these battles that they have. It's tragic when it's someone that's 41 years old. It's even more tragic when it's someone who's 15 that hasn't even got a chance to live. If I could go back and tell my friend anything, it's just that he stole his light from so many other people, and he carried such a burden of always being the happy person and always being the one everyone wanted. But the world is not better without him. It's not. And I wish he knew that. I wish that resonated to his soul because... It's been 15 years, and I still miss him. Yeah. It's hard. Um, so, 
I'll, I'll wrap up Chester. I mean, after his family vacation, he went, he left early. He left early to go shoot a commercial. And at first I thought maybe it was just an excuse to go, but actually he was, a friend was there to pick him up the following morning after they found him to, to go do the photo shoot for the commercial. So law enforcement officials explained that Bennington committed suicide by hanging. The musician was discovered hanging from a door separating his bedroom from his closet. The rocker reportedly was found with a belt around his neck. Sources state that there was a partially empty bottle of alcohol in the room where Chester died, but no evidence of drugs. Bennington has spoken frankly in the past about his issues with the drugs and alcohol. The singer reportedly left no suicide note. The well, you know, inner demons are a real fucking bitch. Right, and like for, for addicts and alcoholics, it doesn't even take that much alcohol to get into a different state of mind. You know, you have one beer and you're you're already there type thing. And so, so yeah, his demons did get to him. You know, the stress of everything else, the childhood trauma. Well, when you start drugs and alcohol that early in life, your brain is so rewired at that point. So, I mean, that's crazy in itself. Yeah, I mean, your brain's not fully developed till you're 25, Five. 27, somewhere in there. But yeah, that was that was it. He came home and he put a belt around his neck and he hung himself from the door. It was, I don't know whether it was coincidentally or planned that he did it on Chris Cornell's 51st birthday. Yeah, it was his birthday. 51st or 53rd. Once again, artists are Right, they're people too. So well, I wonder if he did, because that day had meaning to him. It oh, was just yeah. too much. Like, he couldn't cope with his friend being gone, and it was like almost like a legacy left behind. Yeah. Like, this is his day, I'm going to do right. this. Like, this is the perfect time I missed him. The only him. person that really understood Got what me. he was going through. I mean, your family's there, but really not in the same mindset to see where he's coming from. All right. So, one of the things we wanted to provide everybody, since we're on the topic, is if this is something that you're struggling with internally, obviously, we would want you to find hope. And as I said before, this is not an American thing. This is not a Japanese thing. This is a human thing. And so we wanted to kind of just give a list of contacts. And what we decided to do was we took a look at our listeners from around the world and uh, the sources of countries. So here is... If you're struggling or having suicidal thought, Australia, here's your numbers. 000 for emergency or suicidal hotline, 13, 11, 14. Ireland, which is a beautiful country. I've been there. The emergency contact number is 116123. A suicide hotline number is 440-8457. Zero nine zero nine zero. It's a very long number, <laughs> Ireland. But again, that's a that's a good number. And part of the other thing is is that even if yourself am not struggling, we just want to give you a resource in case you know somebody is, or if someone comes to you and says, "I'm struggling." All right. So Spain, emergency number is one one two. But a suicide hotline number is 914-590-050. Germany is next. Emergency number is 112. But a suicide number, hotline number, is 0800-111-0111. In the United Kingdom, the immediate emergency number is 112. But a suicide hot number, hotline number is 0800-689-5652. Our, our fourth biggest listeners is from India. The emergency contact number there is 112. But a 
suicide hotline number is 1-800-273-8255. Bangladesh, your emergency number is 911. A good suicide hotline number is 246-429-999. Italy, thank you, Italy. Well, thank you, everybody. The emergency contact number is 112, but a suicide hot number, I don't know why I keep doing that, but a suicide hotline number is 800-860-022. Here in America, we have a couple of numbers. Of course, there's 911, but you can also dial 988, but a suicide hotline number is 1-800-273-TALK, which is 825. Five. Now, I kind of got a little bit more specific for here in America. If you are a military vet and having suicidal thoughts or need to talk to somebody, it's the same number, 1-800-273-TALK, press 1. And for our LGBT community members, it is 1-866-4U, the letter U, Trevor. So obviously this was set up in honor of someone named Trevor. T-R-E-V-O-R. So those are the numbers. And feel free to reach out to us in an email if you if you want a listing of all the numbers all over again. But uh, we definitely wanted to provide everybody with an opportunity to, like I said, even if it's not you, but you know someone who might benefit from that information. So final thoughts, Samantha. I don't know who's listening to this, but you're important, and I do think that it, this is a temporary or a permanent solution to a temporary problem, and I hope that you can get out, find someone that's willing to listen to you and help you carry that burden, because we can't carry it by ourselves. Panda Bear? What's, what's the best way to say this? The strongest thing you can do is just say something. That's that's what it takes. If you really, I mean, you got to try. You got to try to say something. That's the I mean that's my advice basically. I don't. I mean, it's it's, it's terrible to see the, the results of what happens afterwards, because you may not be able to see it, but everyone's gonna. I mean, if someone's affected by your decisions, no matter what. But it's not embarrassing. It's not whatever you think it is. You know, negative connotation. It's it's natural to a point, and just say something. Yeah, well, life's hard, man. <laughs> just call the number early. Don't call. I mean, still call, but don't wait until you have a belt around your neck or a gun to your head or a stomach full of pills. We, when you know you're struggling, just make that call. There's professionals there. It's not just a job for them. They're, they're they care. They're doing that job because they they have someone, someone, or they had someone, and they're trying to make a difference. Well, and no matter who you are, what you're doing, someone out there loves you. Find that person. Yeah, even if they're mad at you or whatever else, if they're if they're showing emotion to you, they that means they have they're putting the energy to care about you by giving you a part of their time, part of their day, part of their life, part of their emotion, which takes energy and on a on a physical and an emotional level, it takes that time and energy to give that to you. So they they ha- whoever you know you think is upset with you or. They think about you in whatever way. That means that a person somewhat cares about you. So just don't hurt them. Rena, final thoughts? I, I think you said it earlier. But I think, like I said, Keanu Reeves said it best. Those we leave behind will miss you. 